Good afternoon, everybody. So here's a list of the topics that we're going to discuss today. Uh, I want to touch briefly on why I think this is interesting. Uh, I'll talk about some of the challenges you might encounter during testing an app, whether again, whether it's web, mobile, or desktop. There'll be there might be some challenges while you're testing this thing, whether it's complex protocols or complex something, and you want to automate it. And we're going to show some workarounds on how you can do that to make testing a little bit more efficient. We'll take a brief look at something called Amazon Cognito, which is an identity provider service from Amazon AWS, uh, which is really interesting. It'll be part of the demo. We'll see some details on that. We'll look at briefly the AWS and Azure instance metadata service because no cloud talk would be complete without talking a little bit about IMDS. Also, look at AWS AppStream, which is some technology that I hadn't heard of until last spring, but it turns out it can be really interesting if you're testing something that utilizes AWS AppStream. I'll share a story about the time my Azure profile was hacked. And then finally, we're gonna, I'm going to leave you a few closing thoughts, things for you to look into, things that I think about occasionally and will research once I get time to. So why is this interesting? I love pivoting. Like during testing, if there's an opportunity to pivot, I'm going to try it. Of course, I'll coordinate with the customer ahead of time and make sure that meets their objectives. But pivoting is just a lot of fun. It's like you're moving from one realm into another. So this is kind of the genesis of this talk was it's kind of like pivoting. I was testing web apps and then I'd see that the, the app was hosted in AWS or Azure and seeing that it granted me access to the Azure or AWS environment, or maybe an Active Directory environment sitting behind the thing I'm testing. I just love the opportunities to kind of go outside of the thing I'm actually testing. The other reason that I think this is interesting is there's a decent chance that the thing that you're testing, if it's integrated with Azure, AWS, uh, it's probably recently migrated and it might not have as robust controls in place as the on-prem iteration. So the analogy I like to use for this is if you think of, and we'll see an example where this actually occurred in real life, uh, think of the example where you get a web shell on something. Usually when you get that web shell, you don't have a lot of privileges. You know, if it's Linux, you're running as like the Apache user, which is very limited. Um, with something that migrated to the cloud, as I saw on a test, like there's a chance that the service account that the web app is running with has privileges um, with that underlying infrastructure. So I think there's opportunity there as an attacker. So let's look at a couple of the use cases for automation, uh, fighting automation with automation. So there's, uh, it's not a new technology, but Google's got reCAPTCHA out there, and that's designed to prevent anti-automation attacks. And that can present some challenges during testing. Uh, I'm going to show you a way that we can overcome the reCAPTCHA version 3 and version 2 uh, using Selenium IDE. We won't be able to do that. We won't be able to use Selenium IDE for like the, here's a grid of nine squares, click all the fuzzy panda bears type stuff. But the other versions, which are still out there fairly commonly with organizations, we can overcome that with Selenium IDE. The other use case we're going to look at is a protocol called Secure Remote Password Protocol. And that's something you'll see if you're testing an app that ties into Amazon Cognito. It's a very complicated protocol, and it presents some challenges when you're doing typical app testing. So the first use case. If we look at reCAPTCHA, these are a couple of scre uh, screenshots from Google's page. Basically, the highlighted portions there talk about why we can overcome this with Selenium IDE. It's just solving JavaScript challenges under the... So if you've ever used Burp Suite Intruder, that's not a feature that's built into Intruder. So we, we don't, there's nothing I can configure in there and say, hey, solve the reCAPTCHA challenges that come in like that. So you can use a tool like Selenium IDE to automate your browser so that your browser is going to solve those challenges for you in the background. And now the other use case, and we're going to spend a little bit more time on this use case because it ties into the topic of this webcast. If you're testing something in Amazon Cognito, that uses secure remote password protocol under the hood for authentication. 
So you'll see this again, like during perhaps a web app test or mobile test, maybe the organization developed the web or mobile app, and they didn't want to handle the identity proofing piece, authentication or authorization. So they integrate with Amazon Cognito to do all that. And there's some very interesting implications when they do that, which we'll see in just a second here. So looking a little bit closer at secure remote password protocol, if you look at the screenshot on the right, that's from the Stanford University website. I did some cursory research on this protocol, not a whole lot, certainly not an expert. Amazon didn't develop this protocol, but they use it. And I think Stanford developed it. If you look at that screenshot, it's pretty detailed. But the key thing to take away from that is the password is not transmitted across the wire. So if you've done any app testing and you're intercepting traffic with Burp, that's a problem because you can't mark the password and put payloads in. So these are some of your indicators if you are dealing with SRP during a test. Uh, your most obvious indicator is if the customer or organization tells you, hey, we have Cognito or, hey, we use SRP, then obviously that's a good one. If you didn't get the information up front, though, some other things that you can use to figure out if you're dealing with SRP is you're not going to see the password anywhere in your burp logs. The other thing, you'll probably see parameter names that have the string SRP in them, as we'll see in just a moment here. I like to think of SRP as sort of like TLS and functionality. You know, the password's not exchanged across the wire, but there's a session key that's calculated. And uh, that helps keep it straight in my mind anyways. So to work around this, you know, we could spend a lot of time writing a, a Burp Suite extension to implement SRP. But you know, that would be very specific to the particular app you're testing. And as you can see in that slide, that would be a lot of time spent for a very specific use case. So I prefer to automate the browser for something like this. All right, looking at Cognito SRP in action, if you look at the screenshot on the left, that's the login form. Typical stuff, you know, we got a username field, a password field. The password winter 2022 exclamation point is something normally we would expect to see that in our burp logs. If you look at the, the bubble on the right, that's what's going on underneath the hood when you're doing authentication with this particular Cognito app. So if you look closely at it, there's, a, oh, there's an encrypted blobs in there. We see password claim secret block, all sorts of stuff, but there's nothing that resembles a password. So we can't, there's no way to mark payload for this type of thing and do an intruder attack. And this is where you can use Selenium IDE. It's really easy to get started with Selenium IDE. It's just a browser plugin. You can use it with uh, Chrome or Firefox or even like the, the edge that comes with Microsoft that uses Chrome under the hood or whatever. And it's usually really easy to use. Like most of the time, 80% of the time, it's really easy. There's a record button. You click the record button, you do the thing in the app, click the stop record button, and you've got your test case built. Sometimes you have to dig a little deeper and we'll talk about how to work around that. So there's a couple of nice benefits for using uh, Selenium IDE scripts. One is if you find something like, say the app has no brute force prevention, then you can save this IDE script. And then two to three months later, if the customer or client comes back and says, hey, we fixed the lack of brute force prevention. We need you to retest that. And, you know, two, three months has gone by, you know, countless tests. I don't, I have no idea what I did. You can just break out that IDE script for your starting point. Another use case, I've done this once with a client is I wanted to provide the client with something that they could take to their testing team as they fix the vulnerability and they could run it and figure out if the vulnerability is fixed or not before myself or another tester came in to verify. So in, the reason I went the route of giving them a Selenium IDE script is it was a cross-site scripting vulnerability. It was like three or four levels deep within the app. And I thought, I know I'm just going to write them a basic Python script and it'll be easy. Well, after half an hour of like trying to figure out how to do this, I was like, this is, this is going to be a nightmare. And so I thought, I'm going to see if I can just automate the browser and inject payloads where appropriate. And then, boom, 
which is way easier. You know, that way the customer doesn't have to like install Python or figure out how to run the script. It's just, just install this plugin, you know, run this script that I'm leaving you and you can verify or testing team can verify if vulnerability is fixed or not. So I've got a couple of strategies if I'm using Selenium IDE to automate. Like I said, 80% of the time, plan A will work. Just try recording with Selenium. There is some cases where it's not going to work though. And ironically enough, when I was putting together the demo for this webcast, it didn't work. So that prompted me to develop a new way to kind of work around this. So if you find yourself in that situation where clicking the record button is not going to work, what you can do is you can mock up the JavaScript that's needed to automate your browser inside of DevTools. And that's DevTools that's inside your browser when you click on the enable web developer tools, whatever. By the way, if you haven't seen BB's talks about DevTools, you should check that out. Uh, there's a lot of good information about using DevTools. So anyways, DevTools, you can use that to write your JavaScript. And then what you do is you write it out one line at a time, make sure everything works, and then you can copy that into IDE. So as far as practical application to automating, there's four steps. The first thing you're going to want to figure out when you're automating your browser is you need to figure out what are the elements of interest and how can I select them with JavaScript. Usually you can use some of the common JavaScript APIs like get element by ID if it has an ID. Uh, you can use query selector or get elements by name. After you do that, and that's honestly, that's the hardest step. The next step is you just need to set some values for those elements after you can select them, which is easy. You just take the first line of JavaScript and put equals value. After you've got that working, the next step is to get everything going inside of DevTools. So have our three, four lines of JavaScript running. Make sure it all works. You know, watch your browser, log in, and it's all good. Once you're satisfied with all of that, then you can literally just copy the JavaScript into the Selenium IDE using the execute script command like you see in the screenshot here. And just uh, so you remember, the command goes in the command field, no surprise there. Then the target field is where the JavaScript will go. All right, we're gonna see our first demo in just a second here. It's a basic login demo. As you can see, it's five commands inside of Selenium IDE. The first one just opens the login page. Super easy. Uh, the next step is using a little bit of JavaScript to fill in the username field. Next, we fill in the password. The third step or the step after that is to dispatch an input event to the password field. Why does it need that? I'm not exactly sure why. I, I looked a little bit into it. I think it has something to do with SRP, but I found that it worked if I dispatched the event to the password field. So I, and then the last step is click the sign in button. Here we go. So I've got the login form here on the left. This is the demo app. And then on the right, got Burp Suite. So you can see what the traffic looks like under the hood. It's obviously logging in manually. And if you look over here, we'll take a brief look at what a cognito login attempt looks like all this crazy stuff srp there's that string i was talking about large base 64 encoded blobs uh believe they're encrypted again i spent a little bit of time to see if i could automate srp is challenging that's how i landed on using selenium ID. and now we're going to see the same login with selenium ide And once you've got all of the JavaScript written or whatever, you got your test case ready to go, all you do is click the play button. And then you watch your browser do magical things. I like watching the browser do things when I'm not touching any keys. It feels like there's an invisible robot. So that's a very basic demo of what automation looks like with IDE. So that's nice. And that's a fundamental starting point for doing any meaningful testing. So next we're going to take a look at brute forcing with Selenium IDE. So basically there's four steps. 
You're going to create an array of passwords with JavaScript, again, using that execute script command. We'll iterate through that array, and then we'll use Selenium IDEs for each command. So the for each command in Selenium IDE accepts an array name, password list in this case, and then value is the iterator name, password for this example. And then the third step, we're going to insert a pause statement every now and then. And the pause command is uh, pause and then measured in milliseconds. So the pause command is useful. Uh, sometimes when you're running into issues where your Selenium script is not working for whatever reason, you know, maybe there's asynchronous network traffic being received and Selenium is not waiting for all the responses before jumping to the next step in execution. That, that might be a reason why you need pause statements or you get to a point like, I don't know why this isn't working, but when I pause for two seconds, it does. Well, that's fine. Just know that that's a good troubleshooting step if you're running into issues. And then finally, you want to close the loop with the end command. Okay, so we're going to see a demo here in just a second of what a brute force attack would look like with Selenium IDE. And one thing I wanted to point out, so if you wanted to turn this into a password spray, obviously you just switch the logic. Instead of iterating over passwords, put a single password and iterate over the usernames. Okay, so we can see our code here. There, the first command is creating that array named password list, feeding password list to the for loop. Password is the iterator. Got a couple of pause statements in there you can see. And then we run the script. If you look over here, you're gonna see incorrect username or password in the upper left-hand corner a couple times. So the password is not password, exclamation point. See a second time, and then we'll see that third iteration. Successfully logged in. So something to keep in mind if you're using this approach, just like if you're doing any fuzzing, you need something to monitor the, the reaction of the app. You know, you, you definitely want to have Burp Suite hooked into your browser, even the one that's getting automated to capture all that traffic so you can analyze it. If you imagine, you know, if you're running a, a brute force attack or a password spray, it's going to be hundreds or thousands of iterations, and you're probably not going to sit there and watch every single one and they're like, oh, hey, there's the one that, that's the one that works. You, you'll need something to record all that so you can go back later and figure out if you harvested a password or not. 